Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. How are you managing the often unpredictable cattle markets and the risks they pose to your farm or ranch? We'll share some practical advice that can help you build your own risk management plan or refine your current strategy. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kate Maher. Thanks for spending some of your time with us. Extreme swings in the cattle markets can test even the most skilled and prepared producers. These challenges highlight the need for farmers and ranchers to understand and utilize all the risk management tools available to them. So today we're going to discuss some of those resources and strategies that you can use to help manage risks and set yourself up for success. Joining me now is Michaela Clauser, who is the Associate Director of Producer Education and Sustainability for NCBA, and Jean Copenhaver, a Virginia cattleman who also serves as NCBA's Policy Division Vice Chair. Jean, we've been through times of up and down before, but is this volatility the new norm for producers? The cattle industry is a, is a commodities-based business. We've had valleys and peaks throughout the industry for centuries, but it seems like the valleys and peaks are getting further away from each other, and so uh, this could be the new norm. Uh, I think it is, and uh, we, we need to be ready for that, that norm. So the recent ups and downs has really highlighted the need for risk management um, and, and additional risk management tools for producers. What's your, what's your thoughts on, on the opportunities available? There's a lot of opportunities available as far as risk management, and uh, seem like we tried them all the last 40 years. But there's some new things out. Uh, I know uh, NCBA is working with uh, um, risk management agency within USDA to uh, to to upgrade livestock risk protection (LRP) and they're looking at the, the pasture range and forestry (PRF) too. But they've really changed uh, what they've done with within uh, the LRP. It used to be a low volume uh, deal with customers. Now it's very high volume. Um, they changed it where, where a lot more people's participating with that. And also NCBA has, has helped working with CME all the last few years and trying to keep that stabilized and change it to get better. So we need that capital in the market. It's outside capital, but we still need that in the market to, to back, be a backstop for our producers. Uh, NCBA also in 2020 as a one-time deal um, helped get CFAP done uh, almost $13 billion out to our cattle producers in the country. Yeah, it really showcases how policy really touches even risk management yes. as, as well. So Michaela, you and your team hear from a lot of producers across the country uh, as you put on educational events and just talk to folks. What are you hearing from them in terms of risk management and what they, what they need and want? The big takeaway that we're hearing from those producers are that they would like more resources and just general information, you know, uh, risk management strategies have really expanded recently and they're, they're really interested in, you know, should they get connected with their local extension agents, um, online resources, and then just our content that we have been putting out recently is, is focused on all those risk management strategies, you know, it's such a broad spectrum topic, so we've been focusing on how producers can better those day-to-day -day practices as well as diversifying and marketing strategies. You know, Jean mentioned a little bit of um, work with USDA and, and NIFA. How is NCBA engaging um, to, to make some educational tools and, 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 and education for, for producers on this? We're working with uh, the Extension for Risk Management Education, um, and we have received some funding through USDA, NIFA, to gather those risk management resources, create content, work with those subject matter experts, and then release that and uh, communicate that to the producers, you know, all over the countryside. And we're really excited about the opportunities that we've presented to them. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Gene, we're going to hear from you a little bit later in the show about some of the um, risk management practices that you implement here on your operation in Virginia. Um, but Michaela, you're also going to go across the country and talk to producers all along the beef, uh, beef supply chain. What are you going to talk to them about? So we're going to, you know, talk to these cow-calf producers, stalker backgrounders and, and feedlots and just see kind of what folks do on their operations and hope that producers are able to take some of those tips and tricks back home and implement them on their own operations. You know, this can be uh, 
insurance, uh, those um, daily management practices, and then also some marketing efforts. So we're, we're excited to go see what some of these producers are doing. Yeah, I'm really excited to hear about what people are doing um, that then other people can use too. No need to reinvent the wheel. Um, there's a lot of opportunity out there and a lot of information that folks can take advantage of. We'll look forward to hearing from you later in the show. NCBA prides itself on being the leading source of producer education, and that includes this topic, risk management. Go to ncba.org and click on the Producers tab to find links to valuable risk management tools and resources. While you're there, please take a minute and complete a quick survey about your risk management efforts in the past. Those comments will help your fellow cattle producers across the country. So where can you go to find resources to help you develop a risk management plan? Here to discuss this is Dr. Brad Lubin from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and Dr. Ron Rainey from the University of Arkansas who both have extensive experience in the area of risk management. Dr. Rainey, can you give us a brief history about the Extension for Risk Management Education, also called ERMI program, and why USDA decided to develop and implement this program? Yeah, the, the goal of the, of the program is to really uh, help farmers and ranchers uh, be better able to understand and manage the risks that they face on their operations. And so with the Agricultural Risk Protection Act in 2000, they uh, Congress authorized the Secretary of Agriculture to form what they call the Partnerships for Risk Management Education, which under that authority, they developed the Extension Risk Management Education Program, or ERME, with our goal of providing producers or educating them on the full range of risk management activities beyond crop insurance, but it also inclusive of crop insurance. And Dr. Lubin, how do you see the cattle industry benefiting from this program? You know, the ERME program doesn't directly educate producers. It supports the programs that educate producers through our regional grants program. The, those programs that reach producers help producers understand the, the various types of risks, as, as Dr. Rainey described. It also helps producers understand the risk they really face in their operation. Think of a cattle producer, whether they're feeding cattle in the feedlot or whether they're raising uh, calves on, in the cow-calf herd they're already facing market risk. Uh, sometimes we hear producers think that using futures and options is a risky activity, but they're already effectively long based on what they're investing in their operation. They already face that risk. Risk management is using the tools to help offset that and, and manage the risk they face. I'd like to ask both of you, what's a good starting point for cattle producers when implementing a new risk management strategy and how can cattle producers work more with USDA? Yeah, I appreciate that question. I, I, I like to think of it when I'm talking with clientele of developing a risk management team. You know, uh, farmers and ranchers, they have to be an expert in a number of things, but there are a number of external resources that they can make a part of their operations. And I will start with the, the extension service, so their local county extension contact to, to connect with both some production risk in terms of understanding some of the, the, the best management practices in terms of production, and also connect with those agricultural economists to help them think on some of the record keeping and some of those practices on the marketing or cost management and including also expansion and diversification to help them understand, but also utilize some strategies and tools to really help them be most efficient. And, and Ron, as you described working with the team, you bet that team also might include the lender, uh, the insurance agent, the, the marketing advisor, uh, all of those that can help connect producers to the right tools uh, to build into a strategy. And producers need to recognize that, uh, uh, that they can depend on and draw on that expertise. Trying to master everything themselves without outside advice, uh, that's a risk too. Uh, producers benefit from pulling a team together to understand that risk. Indeed, and, and those various USDA agencies that farm service agencies and natural resource soil conservation service are also some good and vital team members for those producers to plug into to understand some of the programs that help them really operate more efficiently and success, be successful. Dr. Rainey, looking ahead, how do you see the ERMI program evolving and adapting with regulation changes, extreme market fluctuations, rising costs, and so on? Yeah, and as Brad talked about, so we, we don't educate, but we provide funds to educators. That's both in the land grant or the, uh, the academic educators, but also with community-based organizations and grower associations, trying to give them some of those tools uh, that have been developed. And sometimes some of those tools have been developed uh, by some of those grower organizations. 
But to me, is, is one of the things that makes agriculture so successful is its ability to be innovative and to adapt. So right along with that, ERME is going to continue to be innovative and to adapt in terms of how we deliver programs, the types of programs that we deliver. For instance, as we see tremendous pressure in terms of input costs, a number of people within our ERME network, which are the people that we fund, they're adapting or changing in the focus of some of the material that they're developing to understand how to manage in this high cost environment different strategies to, to address some of the rising input costs. And so just we're just going to continue to try to address the needs as they continue to change for our farmers and ranchers. Dr. Lubin, how can beef industry groups partner with USDA to ensure producers have access to this knowledge and resources? Right. Well, certainly we know that beef industry groups and other groups can be applicants and, and actually help deliver the educational programs that we fund. But in those programs, we often see lots of collaboration and working with USDA, particularly as a partner agency or as a collaborator for, for some of the, uh, uh, the opportunities and, and the tools. Think of the assistance programs that come through the Farm Service Agency, uh, the, of course, the commodity programs, but particularly for the livestock sector. Think of the disaster assistance programs that are authorized and ready to roll out as, as needs be. Think of the conservation programs and, and the, uh, the adaptability of those programs through the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And of course, the insurance tools. We call it conveniently crop insurance, but recognize that there are livestock policies as well uh, that help cover market risk or, or uh, margin risk, uh, market price, less feed cost. Those kinds of tools are available through insurance agents uh, backed up by USDA's Risk Management Agency. It's important to know those things exist. It's important to, uh, to understand the kinds of tools that are available. And groups can work with USDA and other partners to help educate producers as to that availability. Thank you both for your time and input. Thank, Thank you. you. Don't forget, if you're looking to make a change on your farmer ranch, you can find valuable risk management tools and resources at the website, extensionrme.org. When we come back, Michaela visits with the cow-calf farm in Kentucky to find out how they're managing risk. In this week's Weather Watch, we're tracking the monsoon off to a bit of an early start. What does the early start mean for the rest of the summer outlook? We'll have that in this week's Weather Watch. Get more from your mower conditioners with John Deere Zero Series Mower Conditioners. Cover up to 10% more acres per hour with the wider cutting width of the C500. Cut time changing knives in half with quick change knives. Mow with confidence thanks to our five-year cutter bar warranty. Get more productivity, tractor compatibility, uptime, choices, and confidence with John Deere Zero Series Mower Conditioners. These are the pennies it costs for Altisit IGR protection, making it one of the best values in the market designed specifically for fighting horn flies on pasture. As a supplement, Altisit IGR is part of what you're already doing. And as a feed through, what your cattle are always doing. Take shelter from the swarm for just two to three cents per animal per day. That's just four fifty per animal per season for horn fly protection that has been performing for over forty years with no known resistance. Altacid IGR. Welcome back. Today we're talking about risk management and some of the steps you can take to protect yourself and your cattle business. Let's send it to Michaela Clauser, who has more from Kentucky. My journey to learn more about how farmers and ranchers are managing risk took me to Lawson Farms in central Kentucky. Nathan Lawson and his wife Wanda started their business here in 2005. My wife and I were both raised in agriculture, uh, both on farms in, in central Kentucky. We have three kids, Addison, Jaden, and Journey, and we raise beef cattle, a commercial cow-calf herd, and also raise corn and soybeans, and lots of hay that goes with that cow herd. Farming close to Louisville can bring challenges and opportunities. The Lawsons took advantage of their location by selling their beef directly to consumers as a way to generate extra income. We realized very quickly that here in Louisville Shadow, with the high cost of land, uh, we quickly needed to find a way to retain more 
profit out of a calf. Um, it wasn't going to cut it just selling calves at weaning uh, off the farm. We had to find a way to really capture more opportunities for profit in that calf from birth to finish. And so we started selling our first beeves off the farm in about 2006. And it really grew from there primarily through word of mouth. One of the opportunities that we took advantage of early on was a cooperative extension course through our local um, cooperative extension service that gave us the chance to learn how to develop a website. Fast forward to today, um, you know, we were able to grow steadily to the point where we have uh, had a really good retention of our customer base. And most consumers really want to know us. You know, they want a relationship uh, with someone. They want to be able to trust someone. And ultimately, um, we have a really good product. So risk management is such a broad topic, you know, that can span from those day-to-day -day production practices to, like you mentioned, uh, direct-to-consumer marketing and some of your marketing strategies. Can you kind of share a little bit about your tools and resources that you've used kind of a, across the spectrum? Sure. You know, I really feel like that when we think about risk management, we have to think of it as a toolbox and we need tools to put into that box to be able to combat those challenges. And so there are a lot of resources out there. And I feel like that for us, education and awareness has been a key piece. When we think about those education and resources, folks like the Cooperative Extension Service come to mind. Um, but also uh, the Farm Service Agency and the U.S. Department of Agriculture offices here in, in our communities. We all report our crops, and so crop producers are familiar with those offices because of that process. Um, as cattle producers, we don't tend to get into those offices quite as often, but I think that that's something that's changing. And so we've worked hard to develop relationships and truly friendships with the folks that we work with at the FSA office. And that helps us maintain an awareness of any potential uh, risk mitigating program that might be available uh, to combat unforeseen losses. When we think of natural disasters like wildfires or, or even in our area, tornadoes and drought, uh, lightning you know, things that we can't control, those programs are available and out there. One of the things that I think is really important for us as cattle producers is to look into insurance products. Friends and neighbors in the cropping world are very familiar with crop insurance. Well, beef farmers and ranchers produce crops too, and that's our calves. And so we need to be able to capture an opportunity to purchase a product that's gonna help us mitigate risk in market losses, ebbs and flows, ups and downs, um, in the cattle market when we market our calf crop um, to be able to help us have confidence in growing those calves and the inputs that we're putting into them, but also uh, peace of mind. So you mentioned insurance programs. Are you referring to the Livestock Risk Protection Program? Yes, So correct. using LRP, you know, there's been an, a recent update how have you implemented that in your operation and what benefits have you seen from that program? Great question, Michaela. You know, livestock risk protection insurance has really become a competitive product to be able to, to manage our downside market risk in the cattle business. And so, um, you know, I have found myself that purchasing LRP insurance for my calf crop uh, which is available at different set stages of growth in the calf, different weight ranges and different classes of cattle from calves on the cow uh, that will be marketed post weaning to yearling cattle that are going to be in that eight to nine hundred pound range, you know, when they're marketed. Um, there's a whole host of products available. And so what I feel like that does for us as producers is it infuses confidence into our marketing approach. Um, insurance gives us some peace of mind. It gives us some confidence in raising those calves to know that that product's purchased on those calves. We have that piece in place to protect our downside risk in the market. And so um, I would encourage beef producers across the country to seek out a reputable insurance agent in their area that is, that is offering the LRP insurance products and just sit down and have a conversation with them. You know, they may even take you out to lunch uh, to talk over LRP insurance and, and, and spend some time to, to learn and get your mind around how that works because it truly is price risk insurance. Um, you're insuring the price of the cattle um, versus the cattle, you know, in their in their rate of growth or 
or, or necessarily them directly, you're hedging the price of those calves when you're getting ready to market them within a window. So it's a good product. So Nathan, with all of that, what is your key message to your fellow cow-calf producers in terms of implementing risk management strategies? To have a plan. You know, even as cow-calf producers, we can develop a risk management plan and have those tools in the toolbox to be able to help us have confidence in marketing our calves, our calf crop, and also reduce anxiety and stress from the marketing process. And so a key part of that is to maintain flexibility. Uh, to be able to pivot and take advantage of opportunities that exist for us and then also uh, seek out a reputable insurance agent that can help you uh, capture the opportunity to um, reduce your risk through an LRP policy and have that confidence in, in raising and marketing those calves. Thank you for sharing such great insight and information with us today. My pleasure Michaela, thank you. Back to you Kate. Thanks Michaela, we'll check in again with you later in the show. Still to come, we hear how Gene Copenhaver, our host for this special episode, works to manage risk on his stalker cattle operation. Stay with us, we'll be right back. They're here, they're hungry, and they can't be stopped with ivermectin alone. Add Safeguard when you deworm your cattle to take out resistant parasites like brown stomach worm, cuperia, nematodirus, and others. With two dewormers from two different classes, you can kill more resistant worms in your cattle, so you don't leave potential on the table. Consult your veterinarian for the diagnosis and treatment of parasitism, then bite back at safeguardworks.com. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, CEO of MyPillow. Retailers, shopping channels, and now even banks have tried to cancel myself and MyPillow. Well, during these times, your support has meant everything to us. So my employees and I want to personally thank each and every one of you by passing the savings directly on to you. We're selling the best products ever for the best prices ever. For example, we have my standard size MyPillow, regularly $69.98, now only $19.98 with your promo code. Or you can get custom fit with my premium queen size MyPillows, regularly $79.98, now just $29.98. Or my king size regular $89.98, now just $34.98. So go to MyPillow.com now and use the promo code on your screen or call the 1-800 number below to receive this exclusive offer. If you do it right now, I'm going to include a free gift with your purchase. Thank you and God bless. Welcome back to Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Today we're learning about the topic of risk management and specific steps you can take to help set your operation up for success. Joining me again on the show is Gene Copenhaver, who runs Stalker Cattle here in Southwest Virginia. Gene, can you tell us a little bit about your operation here? Yes, our operation uh, was originally started uh, by my father and my uncle, uh, probably six, 60 or 70 years ago. Uh, and it has evolved from a general livestock where we had uh, cattle, stalker, cow, calf, hogs, sheep, and burly tobacco. And now we're primarily a stalker operation in the last 10 to 15 years. Our operation is grass-based. Uh, we start, we buy cattle from a local buying station and local markets, and we keep those cattle until uh, they're, they're nine weight cattle and then they're shipped to a feedlot somewhere. This year, all steers, uh, most years steers and heifers, but this year we went with all steers and uh, it seemed to be what we can get and what we know better when we market our cattle. So uh, in that process um, of getting them, getting them in and getting them out, what opportunities do you explore along the way to help manage risk? Well, uh, we manage risk on, on the input side and the, and the sales side output too. Uh, on the input side, we recently built a new commodity shed and we're getting ready to build another commodity shed this summer to buy our feed where it's at its low point and the, the feed keeps well. We'll save up to $100 a ton on feed sometimes and we don't feed a lot, but what we do, we save uh, probably 10 or $15 a head just on, by doing that. And the commodity shed we figure will pay for itself in two to five years by doing that. On the other side, we tried everything on the output side. 40 years ago, we did straight hedging uh, before there was anything as far as options. We've done options uh, for a number of years, and I guess that been, has been our primary thing. 
we get forward cash contracts. We did those in 15 and 16 after, four, after 2014, after the market dropped. And uh, 14 was options. We, we, uh, we, tr we uh, traded up our own options three different times during that year and still had, had some room to trade up again. But, um, you know, we, we'll, we'll try anything. I guess the best thing has come around in the last two years, and we've started that this year, was livestock risk protection. Um, that's a, it's a great program. It's very similar to what we did with, with options and the puts. And uh, we, we do things maybe a little bit different. We decide what our production costs are going to be and what our cost of cattle are. And uh, then we try to protect for any disaster loss uh, above a break-even price, and usually 100 to $200 above break-even. And um, with, with uh, LRP, it's, uh, it's a lot better situation than the options. It's not as flexible, you can't get in and out, but at the same time, you got every month where we, we have a June and July where we start selling, there's not a CME contract for those months in feeder cattle. The big thing, I guess, is subsidy. Um, I was looking at one of our contracts, uh, insurance contracts here in the last day or two, and the subsidy was over 50% of what, what uh, we pay. So, uh, and the other good part is we don't have to pay for it until the, until the contract's due. The insurance contract is due, and uh, before we had to put option money up before, and so that takes away from your cash flow. It adds extra interest if you're borrowing money. This year's it's LRP, and uh, if they keep on tweaking the program and make more common sense things with the program, I think we'll stay with LRP for, for our risk protection on, on that side of it. Um, for a number of years, uh, between the hedging and the puts, um, we kind of sold on the same market, bought and sold on the same market, so we, we thought that was a, a form of risk, risk protection when you're doing that when you're, you're buying your, your new animals and you're selling your new animals, so you're on the same market, so there's not as much vitality there as you would have. Yeah. You really have tried a little bit of everything. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, you talk about LRP. Um, it is a new program. There have been some recent updates. How have those updates have impacted you and, and your insurance program? Well, if, if we uh, get to collect off of it, we're going to collect it 30 days quicker, it looks like. They're going from 60 days to 30 days. And the other, other uh, they increased the number of animals that a person could, could have. And, and throughout the year, I think it went from 12,000 per cycle or 20, 24,000 for the year, which that doesn't affect us. But um, I, I think that's all good. I think uh, any time that you can, you can manage, especially a disaster, we, we never pay full up. In fact, this year, I, th I think our cost per animal is $20. So uh, to insure it fully, I think it was more like $50 to $60. We might look at it a little bit different. We're looking at for the, just the risk of, of, of a big loss or disaster. And that's all, you know, and this year might have been different. We might have, should have gone the other way, but Nine times out of 10, uh, you're gonna lose your money, whether it's a put or your insurance anyway, you're never gonna collect, so. You know, you also have a, you, you're not only managing risk on your own operation, but you have a, a background in, in finances. Uh, yes. Serving with farm credit, I believe, for a lot of years. What's your, so what would you tell your fellow cattle producers about risk management and, and strategies? Well, I was with farm credit and I was with a commercial bank my last 18 years, but um, one thing we, we required as, as a lender uh, was some type of rich, risk management plan. And, uh, you know, we couldn't tell them how to risk manage because of lender liability, but we could, we always thought that they should have some type of plan and should, should be in the game somehow on managing the risk. And uh, it's very important, especially if you're borrowing money. Because, um, you know, if, if you're borrowing money and you don't have that uh, money to pay back on that line or wh whatever, you know, product you have out there, then uh, it could could be a problem. Yeah, Gene, thanks for your insights and thanks for playing host today for our show. Appreciate it. No problem. Welcome, welcome to be in Southwest Virginia. And don't forget that NCBA staff just right up the road in Washington, D.C. and out in Denver work every day to protect cattle producing families across the country. And you can help by becoming a member. Call 866-233-3872 or go to ncba.org. Still ahead, we'll check in with Michaela again to see how a cattle feeder in Kansas works to manage risk. That story and more, just ahead.
Let's talk a little bit about equine safety and using our horses with inside of our working facilities. Our horseback latch. This may be one of the most important things that you could put on our solution system. We can use this off a horse, or I can grab it off foot. But one of the main features of this is this point right here. It's a long, flat bar, and this is not gonna be sharp up against an animal walking by. And also, it's spring-loaded. And so this thing won't gouge your cattle or your horses, and you don't have to worry about a stirrup catching this. Very important part of safety for your animals and yourself. Maybe the greatest feature on a turret gate is this remote in my hand right here. I'm actually moving a gate right from a horseback, but this piece will save so much time and energy and mainly the safety that you receive from having a remote to stay away from those high impact areas. Did you know you can get reimbursed for attending cattle industry educational events? The Rancher Resilience Grant helps cattle producers attend valuable programs such as Cattlemen's College and Stockmanship and Stewardship training sessions. Local, state, and national events qualify for the grant and successful applicants can receive money back to help cover registration fees and hotel expenses. To apply for the Rancher Resilience Grant, go to ncba.org and click on the Producer tab. Welcome back as we continue our discussion about tools and strategies you can use to help manage and mitigate risk. Let's send it out to Michaela, who's visiting a family-owned feed yard in Kansas. In Southwest Kansas, Cattle Empire is a 53,000 head cattle feeding operation managed by the third generation of the Brown family. Here at Cattle Empire, we're a custom um, cattle feeding operation, which means that the vast majority of the cattle here are not owned by the company. Uh, we take care of cattle for other people. So the way that that changes our risk management is making sure that our customer is always protected and making sure that we can offer the most economical prices to our customer. Well, I've been feeding cattle for about 40 years now. Uh, my dad started before that, and basically he got into cattle feeding as a, as a tool of risk management because he was a farmer. And 40 years, 50 years ago, when cattle prices were high, farm prices were low, and vice versa. So it was a natural hedge, and that's how he got into cattle feeding. The term risk management means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It can mean anything from insurance, and on the feed yard side that usually means you know, property and casualty, employee insurance, um, cattle insurance, all the way through to hedging, which is what most people, especially with corn prices now, want to talk about, all the way to employee training and work comp and helping people stay safe. With everything they have to manage, Trista and Roy believe that carrying on the family cattle feeding tradition for them and their customers makes having a risk management strategy essential. Who saw the Ukraine thing coming? It's one of those things that you're told it's going to come a couple of months before it happened, but you don't think through the ramifications of it. Uh, it's a very dangerous world we live in. There's a lot of things that are affecting our markets that are not fundamental. And that's why risk management to some degree is essential. Especially um, in the climate we're in right now where the world feels so volatile, I find that it's really helpful to focus on what we can control. You know, we can't control what the corn price is today, but we can control that we're doing everything um, on an animal welfare and on an efficiency side. We can control the quality of the flakes that we're making and the quality of the feed and that each sick animal gets doctored properly. We have to focus on those little things that we have control over to help make the best product for the meat case and for our customer. Looking back, what are some general wins and losses that you've seen when, you know, trying out marketing strategies? Like, what, what has that looked like over the years? Our overall strategy has varied a lot. Um, we've been all the way from 0% hedged to 100% hedged on our own cattle. And I think it really just comes down to personal preference. You know, what is, what is each person's risk tolerance? And um, 
and how much equity do they have in, in their cattle. One benefit we provide our customers if they want to open a hedge account through us, we front all their margin while those cattle are on feed. So if they want a hedge but they are worried about margin risk, then that's something that we can help with. I think probably the primary thing that has developed over the years has been the consulting agencies or groups that we work with. Uh, we work with uh, cattle facts quite a bit. We have a weekly call with them to stay on top of markets. Uh, we also have uh, technicians in the markets anymore. Uh, so much of our trading is technical and not necessarily tied to fundamentals. So we've had to add that technical piece over the last probably about seven years. While risk management most often brings to mind cattle marketing, at Cattle Empire, they take a comprehensive approach to their risk management strategies. The amount of risk in the feeding operation uh, extends not only to the markets, but also operationally. We do a lot of things to make sure that the employees are properly trained. We have monthly safety meetings. All of our employees are BQA certified, trying to make sure that we can protect the investment of our customers and their cattle. We have redundancies in both the feed as well as the water operations, making sure that we can feed the cattle no matter what the conditions. So by custom feeding, what sort of strategies uh, can your customers implement or kind of buy into as well as how do you protect both your operation and the customer? One of the biggest risks to our customers is still cattle loss. So the best thing that they can do is make sure that their cattle are vaccinated and ready for a group environment when they get here. That enables us to follow all of the protocols set up by our consulting veterinarian to um, treat cattle and try to be as judicious as possible with antibiotics and keep everything alive to the end point. One of the things that we do to diversify uh, marketing strategies is to, uh, we offer non-hormone treated cattle feeding and verified natural beef here, as well as conventional. So there are three different avenues for customers to get the most bang for their buck or to find a good marketing relationship for them. That's great. Can you also describe a little bit how you protect your feeding resources? What does that look like? So one of the ways as a feed yard we diversify our feed input risk is by taking two different kinds of silages. A lot of feed yards use corn silage. We have went away from that and we use triticale silage and sorghum silage now. And both of those crops um, use a little bit less water and that way we have a spring crop and a fall crop. So if there's a year where it doesn't rain, um, we're not only reliant on one crop to come in. That's great, especially uh, in a year like this year, you know, um, that's definitely been something that's been at the forefront of folks' minds, you know, that drought planning and, and what that looks like when, uh, when feeding out cattle in every aspect of, you know, the cattle industry in every sector. Making any family business last for three generations is a major accomplishment. No doubt, like everyone else in the cattle business, the Brown family has faced spikes in input costs, ups and downs in the cattle market, weather challenges, and more. But through it all, perseverance and a commitment to managing the risk as best they can has carried them through. Can you give us an overview, kind of a before and after snapshot of how these strategies have benefited your efficiency and boosted your profitability? Um, that question is very difficult because a lot of it has been continuous improvement that has happened, you know, throughout the time, the 15 years I've been here and the, the decades or generations before that. Um, so that's really what we focus on is just being 1% better every day to try to make sure that we're making those, those improvements and that, uh, those changes as we go. We really use all these risk management strategies to help make sure our business lasts until the next generation, as well as the businesses of our customers and other partners that we're here for their kids and our kids and our employees as well. Still to come, we talk with another Virginia producer to find out how she manages risk. We'll be right back. As a stocker operator, your job is to turn forage into profit. With the right implant, you can. Revlor G improves grazing performance for 150 days, the same length as the typical grazing period. And it's dosed for stockers' maturity levels, adding up to an extra 23 pounds. See why Revlor G is the number one choice in stocker implants at revlorg.com. 
A withdrawal period has not been established in pre-ruminating calves. Do not use in calves to be processed for veal. From the very beginning, Richie has been dedicated to one thing, helping people deliver fresh, constant water to their animals. Today's Richie waterers rely on a valve design that remains much the same as it was in 1921. It's a simple idea. Do it right and the rest will take care of itself. We never set out to create a company that would be around for a hundred years. We just wanted to create something great. Welcome back to Cattlemen to Cattlemen as we continue our discussion of risk management in the beef industry. I'm joined now by Margaret Ann Smith, who is the sixth generation of her family to be involved in the beef industry. Margaret Ann, thanks for joining us. Tell us a little bit about Southlex Cattle Company, please. Thank you for having me, Kate. So Southlex Cattle Company, we operate a custom cattle buying operation and for procurement of cattle throughout the mid-Atlantic states. Um, we source cattle from both sale barns as well as local producers and then commingle those cattle here and then ship throughout the United States. Um, another component of what we do is also we work with grow yards throughout the Midwest and uh, background those cattle for 60 to 90 days and then turn those cattle into the feeding operations or sell on to other cattle feeders. So you're a really important step in this uh, in the process of uh, how cattle move through our system. Um, what's the benefit to producers that you're buying cattle from? Uh, what's the benefit to them of, of taking the time to plan and, and implement a risk management strategy? So the the most obvious and the simplest one is obviously it's more dollars in their pocket. So um, risk management can have so many different components of it, right? So the one we think of obviously is always, um, we talk about the futures, we talk about commodity hedging and we talk about those. But risk management can also be how you manage your risk on the farm. So how do we manage the risk of um, animal health? How do we manage the risk of your marketing of the actual animal? So for those producers, um, if they are looking at the risk of animal diseases, animal welfare, how do we work through that? So can we plan a vaccination protocol that helps them? Do we time that vaccination protocol that works in their family schedule that we are planning so it's not interfering with vacations or with family travel or a ball game? So, and by also by doing those things, we plan, are we being proactive instead of reactive? So it all works in the time management, especially here in the mid-Atlantic states where um, a lot of producers are part-time operators. So time management for cattle that are um, not their full-time operation, they need to work in around their other occupations. It's really uh, interesting to take that component uh, of time management into a, into a risk management plan. I really, that's really interesting. So you buy cattle all year long and you buy a lot of cattle. What risks do you consider when buying those cattle? So for us, we look at everything from the price pieces, uh, trucking, weather, the markets, exports, everything under the sun. Um, and it may be something as simple as whether an ice storm is going on, um, upcoming, a DOT blitz. Um, is that impending? How is that going to impact us? Are, are the trucks going to be on the road? Are we going to have problems there? Um, electronic logging devices. Um, what else? Um, other regulations may be coming at us that are going to be hammered um, to do things. The drought. Um, how does that change where we are able to source our send to cattle to? What is going on here as far as rainfall? Um, but it can also be simple things such as it's graduation weekend. Um, both in colleges or in a high school situation, or it's a holiday. So what does that look like and how people want to move cattle? So those are all part of risk management that are a little bit different when you're in the cattle buying side of things um, that are a, just a different component of risk management than the typical how we hedge or how we are going to worry about um, penciling a profit into these cattle. That's really interesting. You mentioned the drought. There's a lot of country in drought right now. How has pasture range and forage insurance helped you manage risk? So we're able to use that here um, in our operations here in Virginia. Um, and it's a unique tool. Um, it's a, it takes a lot of time and effort to learn about the grids and how to use those and, and how to dial down and to study the patterns um, and to look through the patterns. It has enabled us to be able to offset feed cost in those bad years and those years when it doesn't rain in a certain grid or quadrant. Um, and that has been imperative. Um, and it's, it's neat, it's different um, in the sense that we're being able to ensure whether we're gonna rain or not. Um, and the, the data behind it is, is tremendous to go back and, and sometimes even maybe not necessarily what we're going to be paid out, but the history and, the, and to look at what goes on in different segments of the areas and in different pastures. Some of this stuff is truly cyclical. 
Um, and we definitely go in patterns and it's neat. So um, to think back what either a, a grandparent or a great aunt or a great uncle has said about this went on in this part of the county, you know, in the 20s or the 30s, well, it returns back, you may almost 100 years later, the same patterns return. So, um, but it has been a neat tool for us to be able to offset those feed costs on those bad years. You mentioned data. You keep track of a lot of information. How does data management play into risk management strategy? So data management, um, it becomes all hands on deck and it goes from the top to the bottom. It is everybody from um, all of our folks. Um, it, it is not just me. It is not just my other half. It's not just my brother and my dad. It is everyone who works here. Um, we all keep up with data. And then some of it is automated, right? So we use uh, climate, we use some of the automated systems that just fill in, feed in information as we need it. Um, and those are kind of cool tools, but we also use a lot of software that helps us track that, whether it be pasture movements, um, tracking how many days cattle are in feed, looking at animal units, um, looking at uh, pasture conditions and stocking rates, those things. But being able to get that information very, very quickly and at a minute's notice, whether it be for a government report, and, and being able then to take that data and then piggyback it right into what we need to plop it into a government um, program makes it so much more seamless to do. Um, it makes it a little bit easier. And with the labor situation we're all in, no matter where you are in this country, anything that we can do, if you do it one time, one step, and if you can pull a report and hand it in, it makes life so much simpler. Yeah. This has been great information on just this very broad topic, like you said, of risk management. Uh, thanks for your input and thoughts. Really enjoyed it. Yes, thank you. We'll be back with Cattlemen to Cattlemen right after this as we wrap up with some final thoughts. Stay with us. Cattle producers across the country work hard to care for their animals and their land. The USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service is there to help. Find out how you can work with NRCS to develop a conservation plan for your operation. Find possible funding resources for implementing conservation practices or get free expert advice on ways to improve your farm or ranch. Visit the website nrcs.usda.gov today. Weeds will rob me of my investments. The weeds are not palatable to the cows. They will not eat them or if they do eat them, they, some of them may be toxic. So there's a return on investment by allowing there to be more grass available to be grazed by the cattle. Time now for Weather Watch with meteorologist Matt Makins. Last time we talked about La Nina and how it increases wind and some of those other characteristics. This time, let's change gears. We've been so focused on La Nina. Let's chat about the monsoon and how the early onset of the monsoon, well, it hasn't really changed the summer outlook, but we'll take another look at that summer outlook here in just a moment. It is a little bit early to see the uptick in moisture in some parts of the Four Corners region or the southwest for the monsoon to kick in, but let's check on how the precipitation has done for much of June. And we've seen a dramatic increase in the moisture for the Pacific Northwest, been very wet there. Again, that's not monsoonal, but positive to have the water there. Where the monsoon has been most active is right down here. So let's fly in and zoom into the southwest. Sections of southeastern Arizona and western New Mexico have had the highest increase in rainfall. It's a little bit early if you want to follow a textbook definition of when the monsoon classically starts, but it's not necessarily out of the question. So does this early onset of the monsoon, if we want to call it that, uh, does it have any bearing on the summer outlook? And not likely not likely at all. Let's see how it does benefit us though. The benefit will come greatly in the drought conditions. So looking at the latest drought monitor through mid-June, we see kind of this bullseye. See that bullseye of the, the lighter colors into the yellow there in central Arizona? Well, that's an indication of the lowest drought reading or abnormally dry conditions. And then you expand away from that bullseye and the rest of the four corners in the southwestern region, the reds, those are the highest drought category. So most extensive longest lasting drought in that area. Where I think we'll see the greatest improvement will still be coming out of Arizona. Already in the best shape, we'll continue to see improvement as we go throughout the next, say, six to eight weeks, and perhaps even longer if the monsoon can hang on a bit. Into New Mexico, West Texas, uh, Southern Colorado, those areas are the biggest drought problems. 
there will be some benefit. Obviously, we're adding water to an area that needs it. However, we're also seeing that water coming in too quickly. So there's a flooding concern and soil penetration may not quite be there, but at least we have the rain falling. So we will see some improvement in the drought categories throughout much of the Southwest, but I don't think it's going to be a dramatic improvement. We're not going to get rid of the drought, but we may help it. We may beat it a little bit. Here's that summer outlook. You might have seen it already in your newsletter or Directions Magazine. We're going to break even for the Southwest this year out of the monsoon. Surrounding that area, pretty dry, dry out into the Corn Belt. But again, the monsoon off to an early start will break even this year and in some cases beat down the drought a bit. We've heard a lot of great input today from producers in different sectors of the beef industry. Michaela, how can producers take this information along with resources and utilize it in a risk management program for them? So our goal for this program and this content is for producers to even take, even if it's just one practice and implement it back home to their own operations to better their risk management strategies so they can be more profitable and more productive. You know, we've dedicated a lot of time into finding additional resources and uh, putting them together on a landing page on ncba.org underneath the producer tab um, titled risk management. We hope producers are able to, to go and check that out um, as well as, you know, I encourage folks to reach out to local extension or a USDA agent. You know, there's a lot of different strategies out there and we talked about how risk management is such a broad spectrum and I think that that is what we have certainly seen today, you know, from a cow-calf diversified farm in Kentucky all the way to a feedlot in Kansas. You know, there's definitely something for everyone to improve upon, and we just want to help those resources be readily available for, for cattle producers all over the country. Every little bit helps with high input costs and volatile markets. Thank you to you and your team for what you do to bring these resources to producers to help them be more successful. Appreciate you being here. If you'd like to learn more about the information you heard on this show and what resources USDA offers to help manage risk, visit the website, extensionrme.org. And don't forget, there's more great information on other beef production practices on the website, ncba.org. Just click on the Producers tab to find links to valuable tools and resources that could help you be more profitable. And while you're there, please take a minute and complete a quick survey about your risk management efforts in the past. Your comments will not only help your fellow cattle producers across the country, but also help NCBA and USDA continue to provide you the most up-to-date resources and information. That wraps up this special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks so much for spending time with us. We'll see you again next week. <music>